this struggle, the guy went first and the young couple, who were taller and stronger than mother and me. They carried their suitcases with ease. At the far edge of the snowfield, perhaps a mile's walk, was the forest where the Red Cross was waiting. Can we get there? Under normal circumstances, this was a beautiful romantic winter night filled with stars, the moon, and the clear, brisk air. I was okay trudging forward. Suddenly, mother dropped to the ground, laid down spread eagle on her back, sinking into the snow. She was gasping for breath between words as she spoke. In the concentration camp, I promised Adonai, the God of all Jews, if I survived, I would deliver my children to him, to Israel. You hurry now, take the bags to your brother. I'm sorry his good suit will never get to him. She gave up. A typical insensitive teenager, as I was, I told her she was crazy and to stop playing games and keep going. The guy didn't look back. The young couple trudged away ahead, nearing the forest. Clearly, it was not one for all and all for one. You know I can't carry all these bags. They're too heavy, I said, as I pulled her up. Wet snow weighed her down. I brushed it off, and she tried her best to follow me. We didn't speak. By the time we were near the forest, it was almost daybreak. I dragged her by holding one handle of one of her bags and making a deep dent in the snow with the others. When I heard voices urging us on, directing us toward them, my heart skipped a beat. They were the Red Cross volunteers waiting, leading us to a small hut that was warm and dry. My mother kissed the ground before going inside. I collapsed. I didn't realize until many years later that, the only, that only her body was with me. She left her heart, her soul, energy, and optimism there in the Hungarian snowfield two nights before Christmas. Call it a form of transference redirectional feelings, identities. I was no longer just a girl. I became the newest addition to adulthood. This was it. She had nothing left to give. So this um, escape when you finally made it out of Hungary though was actually not your mother's first attempt to get you out of there. And her dream was always of getting to the promised land of Israel. And that led you to the doomed refugee ship, ship, the SS Exodus. So tell us, how did your mother manage to get you and your brother and yourself onto the boat? And then I know you have a passage you're going to read from being on that boat. Um, right after the war, the Zionist movement was uh, gathering orphans all over Europe and, and uh, various small, every country. And uh, the movement was to at least get the orphans out of uh, the continent and get them to then Palestine. And uh, my mother heard from somebody about it and found a way to enroll my brother and me. And, uh, but she had to make a deal that she cannot tell anybody that she was our natural mother because the other children didn't have one. So everybody knew my brother was my brother, but no, not that we had a mother. So we got involved, and it was run as a, as a terrific um, Jewish uh, children's camp with a lot of politicking interspersed and a military system. We had to learn to uh, uh, get up at six and raise the flag and sing the songs and, and just be very, very orderly and um, prepared for any kind of action. That was the bottom line. Came, came July 11 of 1947, I believe. Thousands of people were ensconced inside the wooden ship that was camouflaged to look like a freighter and sailed under some foreign flag. It was manned by Haganah volunteers from all over the world. As Mother dutifully guided the groups of kids to their sections, she was constantly praying. We were stacked in three levels of raw wooden bunks, narrow and hard. Our group, with my brother in sight all the time, and my mother in charge of several of us, was on the left side of the ship. There was a porthole nearby, and kids were always 
clamoring to look out at the majestic ocean. None of us had ever seen an ocean before. Despite all the careful planning, the camouflage failed. In just two days, English warships were following us from a distance. We went on alert. I wasn't allowed to leave my bunk. Even the bed then we used was now emptied only once a day, not up to each use. The stench grew, the sweaty bodies and dirty clothes of hundreds of unwashed people got thicker and more nauseating by the minute. Helpless people pray in Yiddish, it is called davening. The murmuring sounds of the religious men's prayers may reach a crescendo and linger down. It was crowded and dark. The interior of the ship seemed to be an endless black tunnel filled with the moaning of countless invisible people. To me, everything seemed big. Everything and everyone was overwhelming. The stink within the confines of the unsanitary interior was the norm. We had to get used to it. All I knew was to keep my head down, sit low in a triple-decker bunk bed, and make no noise. When I had a chance at the porthole, I was too short to see out. One of the bigger kids would lift me up, and I could see the ocean. It was so big, so very big, it made me tremble. It still has an effect on me. So now you ended up back in your homeland of Hungary, and at a very young age, you were a very promising ballerina. I mean, this woman had so many talents, it's incredible. And then in, in, in your early teens, you became a gymnast with Olympic prospects. And of course, being a typical teenager, to you, the revolution, as you say in your book, was just another inconvenience to try to live your your typical teenage life. I had a thing right? going. <laughs> so you were not too happy when your mother actually made you escape because that was really the end of your your Olympic dream. But you did escape, and you did not find your way to Israel, but you did find your way to America, and the first stop was Newark, New Jersey. So read us that. Buses, buses took us to Camp Kilmer, an active army base with enough empty barracks to house all of us. Mother objected profusely to going to yet another camp. She reminded the interpreter that since she, she and I had a place to go to, they should just let us go. But no, we had to spend the night to stay on schedule. Walking back from the cafeteria in the dark, Mother and I were stopped and surrounded by four soldiers. We didn't think anything of it and gave them friendly smiles until one of them pulled, pulled out his penis and put it in my hand. <laughs> Mother started to beat on his chest, of course to no avail. The men were healthy young soldiers who liked that they were feisty and fought back. Luckily, several members of our refugee group were coming out of the cafeteria and heading in our direction. They were going back to the barracks just like we were. The soldiers saw this and disappeared into the night. Mother and I followed the others and spent the night wide awake, scared of more attacks, even though we were inside the women's barracks. The following morning, a nice young language specialist in suit and tie told us in Hungarian what would happen next, how each person would be interviewed and assisted in the upcoming leg of that trip. He called mother's cousin, Dr. Ernst, in Toledo, and arrangements were finalized. When he asked if there were any questions, I wanted to know how to say, I do not understand, and please speak slowly. <laughs> I wrote them down phonetically. These were the recurring phrases that comprised our entire English language experience, and I entered high school in September. After the orientation, the interpreter accompanied mother and me to Grand Central Station in Manhattan. He gave us a $5 bill and told us where to get our train. He said goodbye and went on to attend to other refugees. We carried our two bags each, the same two bags we left Budapest with, and headed toward the train gate. We passed the hot dog stand. The good aroma made us hungry. We went to the counter and sat down. I pulled out my pocket dictionary and asked for food. Mostly, we ended up pointing. We bought a slice of creamy, frosty white cake from the case and some coffee. 
In other words, I changed back from my $5 bill. <laughs> the long train ride gave us a chance to rest and think about seeing my brother and wonder about our new lives. We arrived in Toledo without a penny in our pockets. It was the day of, of my 16th birthday, sweet 16. We were greeted by town officials besides my brother and an interpreter. It was a really nice day. And a difficult new life began. I was ready to excel at my Americanization. It seemed like the whole world was smiling at me. So Catherine did eventually make it to New York. And that was where she finished high school and then college. And then you met a guy. There's always the guy, right? <laughs> he was a very handsome guy, and he was an aspiring actor, and his name was Byron. And they ended up getting married and headed to LA because Byron was, of course, going to become a star, and you were going to help make that happen by becoming a Hollywood agent. So tell us a little bit of that. First, tell us before you do the reading how you and Byron met, because that's a great story. Too. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> because I was only around for a few years in this country, but I remembered that how much I loved theater, and um, I started writing as a child uh, for everything and everybody. And, um, and I said, if I could do it in Hungarian, why can't I do it in English? So I went to take a um, course in playwriting, which is, I only understood theater at the time. And um, out of about 35 or 40 students, everybody had to do a one-act play at the end of the season. And when I played, the three of the good ones were going to be play, uh, uh, performed at the showcase in the summer um, um, the theater in, in, hello, in Manhattan. And since in those days, uh, Broadway wasn't open during the summer, there were some very good actors available to do little theater and showcase theater who did want to be seen. And as it were, and this is where I'm proud, my one act play, with all the words I knew in English, um, was big. And it turned out to be well done, and I had cast uh, Byron for the lead because he was exactly that, that cocky, good-looking man that I liked, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the rest of it. So, so it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're in LA, and you were, you were sitting around and, and Byron had all of his acting friends and they kept talking about all these people who got these parts and they weren't, right? And then you said to him, why aren't you guys getting yeah. these parts, right? Said, because we don't have an agent. So I said, what's an agent? <laughs> and he told me, what's an agent? I said, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I was uh, quite pregnant with our daughter and um, had plenty of time to prepare to be an agent and found out all the deals. I called all the deals, find out about the requirements, and nobody laughed at me. The laughter only came after the fact. <laughs> but at the time I got in, I, I became an agent and I represented my husband among some other actors. Um, I did see their work, so I had a good sense about their abilities. It wasn't just a, a, a thing of, oh, well, he's a friend, I'm going to represent him. No, I knew enough about them to know what to put them up for. Um, the hard part was getting inside the industry because normal people are, are um, interns in agencies and learn the business and learn each other and they work together as years go by. Nobody just pops in and becomes, hey, I'm an agent. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> so read a little bit of that. It starts with page 177, the middle of that first paragraph. And that was, uh, well, I have to tell you, um, you know how business people dress. This, I was dressed by my husband and, and his friends. So I went out agenting in a micro mini dress, <laughs> knee high boots, fall, big fall, mile long eyelashes, and my little briefcase. Wow. So everybody wanted to talk to me. <laughs> 
and that was a good thing. That's how I did get in. But I didn't know how funny it was until yesterday. <laughs> so, the, but that was the start. Becoming an agent was the start of a whole series of jobs you had in Hollywood during the 1960s and the 1970s, including being a screenwriter. And it was also the start of the end of your marriage, but you're gonna have to read the book to read that <laughs> chapter in her life, which there's quite a lot there, let me tell you. So now let's get into the juicy details because we wanna get into those Hollywood days. And we are talking about Hollywood in the 60s and 70s. And you experienced this from a very unique perspective. You said that Me Too was everywhere. True friends are not true. And so tell us, what was Hollywood like in those days for women who were aspiring to be screenwriters or directors or editors, anything other than actresses? What was that like for you and other women? Well, even, even actresses. I think that everybody was used in one form or another because all the young people are beautiful, are full of hope, and there's always uh, the guy at the next level whom they have to convince that they can do the job, and now they are going to be abused, and, and, and um, the body becomes um, disrespected to the degree because you so believe in yourself, in your talent, and, and your ability to get to the point where you want to get, that you even believe that, but, that this is part of the process, that is normal. And that's when you have to have an exit plan. If you don't have an exit plan, and if you don't accomplish what you want to do within a given period of time, you gotta get out of there. I didn't know to get out of there, and God got me out of there with one hell of an earthquake. Uh -huh. uh, and that's when I realized that I was done, because there was nothing else I could do or give or take. And, um, you were uh, wanting to know about bad guys and good guys. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I'm so. willing to say, without experiencing, uh, experiencing both sides, yeah, I, I had my ups and downs. Um, but everybody, all, all, there were wives who divorced the right guy and um, got to produce a series, a television series. That was part of the settlement agreement. <laughs> and uh, they couldn't do anything, so you know, six months, a year later, the show was done with because they didn't know what they were doing. But things were cheap. I didn't see that integrity was even, you know, a, a, a good word used. It was not something you took pride in. And and I was stepped up on many times, and uh, um, I had. Um, I had a client, fantastic actress, who is now gone. Her name was Claire Brennan, and she was just on the edge of making it. Uh, we got her to a very high point in her career. And uh, she did a guest starring role in a gun smoke, and as a result, she was invited to the rap party for the end of the season. And uh, I went as her guest because I was her agent. And um, after a while, she was missing from the table for a long time, and I went uh, looking for her, and uh, went to the ladies' room, toward the ladies' room, and out came a um, very famous actor, zipping up. And I hurried in, and Claire was just crashed down on the floor and everything, so she clearly got raped. And there were, there were many others like this. Then. Um, then the big guys, the, the, um, there was a restaurant, must still be there for the Morton's where all the heavy duty people um, had lunch. And uh, it wasn't even in the phone book. So the only people who went there were somebody. And one day I got to go there because Sidney Sheldon took my, uh, um, wanted to take one of my scripts to read. And that was pretty exciting. But that too, it turns out I, go, I walk in there and everybody's looking, you know, there's a bunch of <laughs> men with cigars and whatnot. It was like a men's club, actually. And they are all sitting, and Mel Shaverson, who was a wonderful writer and director, and they all think that it's a little girl, you know, with this envelope 
and I knew I wasn't being taken seriously. And it turned out that Sidney liked my script, gave it to one of his production companies that were working on one of his projects, and then months and months went by and I didn't hear, I wrote the company a letter saying that Sidney Sheldon gave you this script and hey, you know, what's happening? And um, I didn't hear back from them, but I heard from Sidney Sheldon and he wrote me a nasty note saying, how did you dare to write such a letter? I don't know, I told the truth. I gave you a script, you didn't answer, nobody answered, so I wanted to know. And he never talked to me again. And you know, and you don't, you admire these people so much for what they are. And, you know, and I come here into that whole thing with the mentality of a small-minded, middle-class, middle-European woman of the 50s. And here it is just swinging away and nobody has any values. And um, I did my best because all my clients had cards, all my clients got their SAG cards and they could now go into other agencies. So that's when I went to law and uh, I didn't know anything about law, but I learned. And uh, I had a job that uh, paid me. But I don't think the guys were any better in law either. <laughs> so I don't know if it's, you know, and me too, I think me too is any glossy business has big bucks. And any little person trying to get in will try anything to get in there. And that's just nature. But Harvey got caught, but hey, Harvey was not the only one. <laughs> and he really got caught. Um, so pretty much Hollywood is not a nice place for, except for a few years when you're very young and you want some experience. And, but you don't make it in the, next, you know, in the first few years. Don't stay there. And it's hard to tell the young people. And it was hard to tell my husband. And uh, it was just, he, we ruined each other's lives by having you know, not having a sorted out plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't learn those things until after the fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs>